to the last two MDF meetings because a hurricane named Matthew came to Florida and a little girl named Charlotte came the year before. But it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, my entry into the myotonic dystrophy area was, uh, you know, I'm a scientist, and so scientists have these clubs. And I was a graduate student at the University of Rochester, and we studied RNA, so we had an RNA club. And one day, this, this tall, thin guy came into the RNA club with a recording of an EMG muscle contraction and relaxation of a DM1 patient, and that guy was Charles Thornton. And little did I know that about 15 years later, I would be sitting up here and talking to you. But it's a great pleasure for me to do that. Um, I work in an academic lab. Uh, for about the past dozen years, we've been trying to design small molecules that target RNA broadly. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about why we think we might have some ability to test the hypothesis of whether you can treat the myotonic dystrophies with a small molecule. Um, <clears throat> So I want to, want to start with our team. And so I don't think you can do much of anything without a team. Um, we have, I have my own laser pointer because that's what I do. And so let's see if it works. So this is my academic lab. And you notice this person that's hiding here. This is the superstar of the group, Suzanne Zuchek, who is now here at Expansion. And she was an MDF Funda fellow that worked on trying to develop the technology I'm going to talk about uh, in the next few minutes about drugging these RNA repeats for type 1 myotonic dystrophy. Notice something else. There's this guy, Eric Wang, that's here. He's also a Funda fellow. And so one thing that I want to really press upon you guys is that the basics, you, you guys all recognize that drug discovery is a long and uh, very risky process. But one thing that has been accelerant for, I would say, all of us in the field has been the energy that you all bring to it. Uh, the MDF and these Funda fellows, which is, a, you know, it's 50,000 bucks. We wouldn't be where we are today without that. Um, also, a lot of the basic science has, you know, <clears throat> when you're in the rare disease space, one of the issues when you're doing drug development is it's rare, right? And so it's very, very critical that foundations like MDF organize patients together so that when a clinical trial starts, you guys know about it and that there are people that uh, we, you know, when drugs come about, can uh, mobilize to test therapeutic hypotheses. So it serves a huge, hugely important um, presence for us. This was taken about two days ago where all of our expansion team uh, came to Nashville uh, for this conference. <clears throat> um, what, are, what are we doing? So we're trying to develop small molecules that target RNA. And so when you think about a small molecule, what do you think about? So small molecules are things like aspirin, Tylenol, Aleve that you swallow from a pill and you take. And so our ultimate goal is to, be ta to take small molecules that can target the RNA that uh, causes type 1 and type 2 myotonic dystrophy. And the advantage of these small molecules is that they can obviously be orally bioavailable, um, that they can be engineered to do various things, like for example, uh, one thing that I found has been interesting since I'm here is that <clears throat> when there was a patient questionnaire, uh, you know, the patient said one of the major issues I have is with sleepiness. And so if you want to treat uh, myotonic dystrophy issues about sleepiness, then you have to get a drug that crosses the blood-brain barrier. And so our ability to have small molecules that target these RNA repeats allows us a lot of ability to change the structures of these compounds and get them to, for example, cross a blood-brain barrier, get into the brain, or... Uh, design a molecule that can more readily get into a skeletal muscle, for example. And so uh, that's a little bit different than some of the other larger molecular weight technologies. Because we're taking small molecules, we can leverage a lot of synthetic chemistry expertise to optimize these compounds. Um, when you start, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about starting a company. When you start a company, you have to get people to give you money. And so you guys all have 401ks. And if you don't have one, you should have one, right? And so you get a return on investment in those. And a lot of what's happening is you have venture capitalists who have money where they're, uh, what they do is they try to fund companies to invest those dollars. And so we've been able to attract a wide variety of people within our board of directi directors, such as Scott Rockledge, who's at 5 a.m., 
Uh, I want to point out uh, Kevin Forrest is our CEO. He was CEO of Sidera, and he was also with 5AM. And also Beth Seidenberg is on the board, who's at Kleiner Perkins. Um, this is a pretty substantial amount of backers who are betting that we could make a, uh, get some path to making a drug in type 1 myotonic dystrophy. So Kleiner Perkins, for example, funded companies that you may or may not know, like Google and Apple. So these are significant and serious venture arms that really want to push therapeutic discovery to patients. Expansion's pipeline today is we have spent the vast majority of our efforts on trying to lead optimize compounds that target CUG repeats and type 1 myotonic dystrophy. We have a wide variety of compounds that are targeting the CUG repeat and DM1 that have been through a number of animal models uh, to improve varying uh, issues with uh, disease, whether it's phenotype or genotype. We also have a very active program on, on type 2 myotonic dystrophy. Uh, one of the big advantages of MDF is you guys are constantly talking to patients, and so there are many sessions um, in this, this, uh, this foundation's meeting about accelerating drug development in type 2 myotonic dystrophy. And so once animal models and other tools are developed, we will very rapidly initiate programs on drugging not only the CUG repeat that causes type 1 myotonic dystrophy, but the CCUG repeat that causes type 2. Just to briefly remind you in a layman's terms how what expansion's doing is we're able to design small molecules that target this RNA repeat. So if you have type 1 myotonic dystrophy, what you have is a rather long repeat of CUG that's shown here, and it forms this structure that's like a hairpin, right? Um, and what happens is that structure winds up binding to proteins that your body makes, and those proteins uh, control production of other proteins. And so when those proteins are bound by this long RNA repeat, you short circuit their ability to control the synthesis of other proteins, and that's how you get type 1 myotonic dystrophy. And the protein that's sequestered by this repeat is called muscle blind like one. And what it does is a loss of this protein by being stuck to this RNA repeat causes a wide variety of system-wide defects, as many of you are, are intimately aware of uh, myotonic dystrophy patients have issues in myotonia, sleep, heart defects, et cetera. And so they're very different issues, but uh, what's nice about the basic biology in this area uh, by people like Tom Cooper, Maury Swanson, and again, Charles Thornton, is that all of these system-wide defects are traced to this one bad molecular interaction. This is a major advantage, and so that means if you can disrupt that one key molecular interaction in many tissues, then you can have some improvement in the disease uh, symptoms. And so each one of these disease issues can be traced to a defect in a key protein whose synthesis is controlled by sequestered muscle blind. And so what we're doing in an expansion is we have the ability to design, that is, we can draw it on a sheet of paper, and with pretty good accuracy, rationally design molecules that can target specifically these CUG repeat structures and free bound muscle blind to make that protein be free to then affect those other proteins in a positive way for developing therapeutics. And so we've been able to show in patient-derived cells that we can design molecules that very selectively target to disease, driving repeats of CUG. So for example, this is how selectively can our drug target the disease repeat of CUG over any other RNAs that might look similar. And so I can tell you that we can very precisely target the disease driving repeat of CUG over other CUG repeats that are expressed in a body, suggesting at least at the level of cellular studies that there is a potential to make very selective compounds that can target these CUG repeats. The other, <clears throat> and we also know that these compounds are binding to the site that we designed them to target, which is very important in drug discovery. You want to know that when you make a, a lead, uh, compound, that that lead compound hits the place that you designed it to hit in the cell, so you can then optimize it for improved properties. The other thing that we've been able to do is design, uh, as Ron had talked earlier with the CRISPR-Cas setting, is we've been able to design basically scissors that can go in and cleave disease-driving repeats of CUG, but instead of using CRISPR and oligonucleotides, we can use small molecules that can bind and destroy them. And so again, we can get very selective destruction of these RNA repeats that drive disease and leave these undisease driving repeats generally untouched. And so it suggests that as we go through a research operating plan to optimize these molecules that we have not only the ability to target things selectively but also the tools to understand if we can target them. 
Um, one other thing that we've been able to do, and this is uh, sort of Star Trek, although I realize I'm a scientist, and so everything I'm saying, you're like, Matt, you, I don't understand anything. I am trying, okay? So you should give me feedback. Um, so um, I'm one of seven kids, and I'm the only scientist. So I've been in this position before, but I normally don't say anything at Thanksgiving dinner. So um, one thing that... Um, we've also been able to do is that we can actually get a disease-driving repeat of CUG to make its own drug, so to manufacture its own drug on site. And the way we do it is we can append compounds with this N3, or it's an azide and alkyne, and when these molecules bind adjacent to each other, they can react to form a drug that's actually synthesized by the disease-driving repeat. And so chemically, this is the equivalent of being able to put hands on parts of drugs, and then when they get to the right site in the body, they grab onto each other so that the drugs wind up holding very specifically to disease the disease-causing uh, repeat of CUG for therapeutic benefit. Um, when we can do that, we can also, this is in a DM1 patient-derived cell, what you can see is we can image that hand-holding or that drug synthesis in a patient-derived cell. And so here's a cell, a healthy cell that doesn't express CUG repeats. And here's a, a, a disease cell from a patient that does express it. You can see, when you see red, that means that this drug is actually being synthesized, and we can get robust synthesis of drug in those cells. And so if you want to dream a little bit, in principle, one could basically have an animal that's a preclinical model feed these monomers and then get only a DM1-affected muscle fiber or a region of the brain to synthesize its own drug and then track it. And the ability that we have to make these drugs on site has very significant implications for the potency of drugs. And so by being able to do that, we can enhance the potency of these compounds by about a thousandfold. And so that's the equivalent of taking, you know, a two-liter bottle of Coca-Cola and drinking it versus taking a teaspoon of a drug. So we're able to do this very precisely and very selectively. Um, but I want to caution you guys. We're off to a good start. We believe that uh, we have no, we're scientists, right? And so at some level, um, this is a science experiment that has to be done. And so we don't have data to suggest that one cannot drug these RNAs with a small molecule. In fact, we have data that suggests quite the opposite, is that it appears that uh, these RNA repeats with traditional small molecule drugs can be quite druggable. Uh, but what we have to do, as was mentioned in the beginning of this talk, is that we have to prosecute these compounds in a way that does no harm to patients. And so this can be a long and arduous and understandably frustrating process. And so right now we're about here through our preclinical developmental uh, package where we're trying to optimize compounds to get them into uh, clinical trials, which have three phases, a phase one, a phase two, and a phase three, where you test in different levels of patients. That can take a matter of years to where hopefully we're out of that into an FDA approval situation where these compounds can be more broadly distributed. And so we're hoping uh, very hard that we can accelerate this as fast as we can, but drug discovery is a long and winding road, and so our job is to try to not make it as, and I think MDF has done a, an excellent, uh, excellent job at this, is trying to map out very precisely how to make that travel from a preclinical compound to a therapeutic as smooth and direct as possible. Um, so that's all I have to say. Thank you guys very much. It was a great pleasure to talk.